today we're talking about robustness. Remember in the last video we talked about when you don't meet the assumptions of linear models, you have two overall things. You can modify your data or you can modify your model. Last time we talked about one way to modify your data, which is using transformations. Now we're gonna talk about another way to modify your data, which is robustness. So what is robustness? Well, you can see my old video where I explained in a little more detail what robustness is, um, if you want more information, but uh, since I'm not really recommending this strategy, I'm not gonna go into detail in this video. But basically, essentially what it does is that it weights the outliers less so than the data in the middle. So if you have non-outlier data, your vote for the fit of the model is going to count a lot more than somebody who's way out there. And so there's lots of ways you could do these sort of things. One is actually by weighting it. Another way is you, some people even trim the top and the bottom of their data and analyze just the middle of their data. That's another way to do it. But either way, robustifying basically means that you kind of sort of either ignore entirely the outliers or at least give them less weight in figuring out what the fit of the model is. So let me just show you real quick how you can do it in R. So here's some R code. It would require the mass package, although there's probably other packages out there that do it. And so instead of doing LM, we do RLM, which stands for robust linear models. So the cool thing is, is the R code is identical. And then in this code, I'm using the visualize function in Flexplot, and then I'm doing chord Cartesian, which basically you can specify the limits of the Y axis if you want to. And once we do that, we get a plot that looks like this, and it still sucks! We got this flat line that's not giving us any information whatsoever. We could, of course, zoom in a little more and see if that line has a slope, but it's just a screwy line, and I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So, um, robustness didn't really work. And by the way, uh, if I were really doing a robustness thing, I would probably do a little more detailed analysis than this. Um, but I have actually done that before and it's not worth the time of the In fact, in one of my previous videos, I'm sure I've done this probably in my former robustness video I'll link that in the description. So let's talk about the pros and cons of robustifying your data Pro the tools that we use are very similar to the tools that we've used before instead of using LM We use RLM and a lot of the same estimates that we used before like means and mean differences and Cohen's D's and correlation coefficients You can also compute those for robust models Although there's some debate about whether they actually make sense anymore, but whatever you can still compute them uh, Another con again, it doesn't work for zero inflated data at least extremely zero inflated data so in this example where we have like 90% of the authors making practically nothing. If you trim 10% of your data, well, you still got a lot of data left that says, we ain't making jack squat. Yeah, that's another disadvantage. And I think the biggest problem with robustifying is it doesn't actually model your data. It models the center of your data, not the entire data set. Well, sometimes outliers are meaningful. Sometimes we want to know information based on the outliers. So we shouldn't just ignore them. It's kind of weird. And that was Tukey's argument, by the way. He wasn't a fan of some of these, well, okay, quick tangent, robust is kind of a general term in statistics that means that your models are tough, you know, that they, they are robust to violations. If you violate an assumption, it's okay. They still fit the model and you get basically the same results. That's what robust means in statistics. And what I'm talking about now is robustifying or using robust methods for your data analysis that actually mess something up in the data or at least actually modify your data. Um, so Tukey was a fan of the idea of robustness and different ways of achieving robustness. He just wasn't a fan of deleting your data. And Tukey was freaking brilliant, so everybody should listen to him. And he was quirky. That guy was weird. I like weird people. Okay, moving on. Those are the two main methods of modifying your actual data set. We transform the data or, and or we use, well, probably not and or, you probably wouldn't do both. So we modify the data by doing transformations or we modify the data by using robust methods. Although in retrospect, I guess some methods of robust defining aren't modifying your data. They're modifying your model if you're reweighting, but that's a technical difficulty you don't have to worry about. But for my purposes, if you are in my class and I'm going to quiz you, there are two methods of modifying your data to make it fit, and those are robustness and transformations. Deal? And the pedantic, if you want to argue, I will meet you in the comments section. So in the next part, we're gonna talk about generalized linear models. Now there are a few things that I just will not talk about other than right now, in passing because I think they're super lame. 
deal. In biology and medicine, these procedures are extremely popular, and I don't know why. They're useless, in my opinion. You can have like a non-parametric T-test. I think, I think that's called a Wilcoxon, and then there's a Spearman rank correlation, and then I have to look these up every time because I never use them. The Kruskal Wallace and the Man Whitney U. So these are all um, non-parametric procedures that you use when you have screwy data. And when as a biostatistician, I use these all the time because I didn't know any better, but now I know better. So all these are basically just transforming your data into ranks. So it's just sorting the people in terms of highest score to lowest score and then analyzing the sorted data. I, I don't like that idea uh, because you have all the disadvantages of transformation. So you lose the original scale, the variable, and you're not actually modeling the data. You're modeling the ranks of the data. You should model the data. If you're, if linear models don't fit, then use a different model, folks. So yeah, these other methods are old, outdated, and the only people who use them are doctors and biologists. Yeah. I guess that ends my controversial opinion for today. Although among statisticians, I don't think it's controversial. I think it's just, anyway, moving on. Long story short, don't use them. Now I'm sure you're asking right there. <coughs> what I do? My sincere apologies, the camera decided to cut out. Maybe it was that evil fly that keeps flying around. So the previous approaches required us to modify our data in some way. With the general linear model approach, we don't modify our data. Instead, we assume the residuals follow a Poisson distribution or a gamma distribution or a binomial or a negative binomial or something like that. And so real quickly, I'll talk about the pros and cons of the generalized linear model before I go into detail on that. One, they actually do model the outliers. And so the results of the data can be generalized to the outliers and they don't throw data away. That's pretty cool. Two, they tend to actually fit pretty well if you find the right model, but it does come with some disadvantages. It's a little harder to do than the linear models. Not that much harder. Sometimes it's tricky to find the right generalized linear model. Another problem is that the estimates that we know and love are often also kind of sort of transformed. And so you're not talking about you know, the change in Y for every change in X for the slope, for example, you might be talking about the change in log odds or the change in the inverse or the change in the exponent or something like that. So similar disadvantage to the uh, transformations. Also, uh, a lot of the statistics that we know and use and love like R squared and Cohen's D and mean differences don't really work anymore. Means are great when you have normally distributed data, but when you don't have normally distributed data, computing the means sometimes doesn't even make sense. I should say it makes sense still, but uh, the meaning of the mean, the meaning of the mean, wow, that was fun. The meaning of the mean changes now, or at least it needs to be interpreted differently. But despite that, we can still use flexplot. We can still use the visualize function. We can still use compare.fits. We can still use model.comparison. We can use all these beautiful functions that I've created for you to interpret what our data are saying. Isn't that fantastic? So with that, let me just review the learning objectives from the last two or three videos. I don't know how many I'll split this up into, just in case I had to do an extra. Thanks for joining me. Put it on repeat. All right, uh, so goals and objectives. One, why are violating assumptions a problem? Well, not only do they inflate type one and type two errors, but they also just indicate that we have the wrong model. We should probably choose a model that actually works. Two, what are the two main approaches to poorly behaved data? One, we can modify our data with transformations or robustness, or we can modify our model using non-parametric versions of the analysis, which I don't like or we can use generalized linear models. Three, two ways we modify the data. Again, like I said, transformations or robustness. Four, or whatever number we're on, two ways we modify the model. We use generalized linear models or we use non-parametric models. Uh, 17 or whatever, uh, know what transformations are. It's basically we're applying some mathematical function like the log or the square root or the square to our data to make it look more normal. Two reasons why transformations are okay. One is because they preserve monotonicity, which means that the order of the data is exactly the same as it was before. And two, sometimes some variables actually make more sense in a transformed metric, like a logarithm, like decibels we talked about. Number whatever we're on, transformations and uh, ethics, I guess you would call it. 
And again, the basic idea is if you didn't anticipate that you had to transform your data, you are in exploratory or rough confirmatory mode, which means you should not present your results as if they are confirmatory. Again, see the link in the description about that video. Also know the basics behind the R code for transformations and robustness. I gave you some examples. They're there if you need them, but I didn't go into much detail on them. Next, the pros and cons of transforming your data. Again, the pro is that we can use all the same tools we've, we've used before, but the con is that now a lot of the interpretations that we liked before are different. The slope isn't as intuitive as it used to be, for example. And they won't work for zero inflated data. What is robustifying? Robustifying basically means that we are either discounting or completely eliminating the outliers in our data set and then analyzing the data set as if we didn't have those outliers there. Uh, pros and cons of robustifying. One, the tools are very similar to the ones that we've used before. So they're familiar, yay. So that's the pro, but we do lose some of the metrics we liked before. And I actually didn't talk about this earlier, but I, I mentioned it in passing, but I should make that a learning objective that if you are trimming the top and the bottom of your data, I don't know that an R squared makes sense anymore. So some of the metrics that we usually like to use like R squared or R or Cohen's D, we can't really use those anymore because they're kind of a biased representation of the mean or whatever. Also, another con of robust find is they don't work for super zero inflated data. And I think the biggest problem is that we're not actually modeling the data. Next, what is the generalized linear model approach? Basically, instead of assuming we have a normal distribution, we assume that they follow a Poisson distribution or a binomial distribution or a gamma distribution or something like that. And we're gonna go more into more details on that in the next video. Uh, what are the pros and cons of the generalized linear model? They, if you choose the right model, they fit very well. They actually model the data, but statistics are a little harder to interpret, at least like the slopes and the intercepts. And a lot of the statistics that we like don't transfer. You can't compute R squared with generalized linear models, at least without like really hacking it in ways that I'm not sure are a good idea. And I should probably put the pros and cons in order, but I forgot. But one of the pros is that you can still use the majority of the flexplot functions that you've used so far, like visualize and compare.fits and model.comparison, that sort of thing. So that concludes my video about robustness and transformations and or whatever this video is. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to decide to cut it later. I hope to see you next time where we're going to go more into detail about what a generalized linear model actually is and how it is done. I'll see you then.